How many of you guys had a paper route growing up? Anybody even know what a newspaper is, right? Like, who every Sunday morning, it can't just be me, right? But like, you woke up in the morning and you ran to get the newspaper because you wanted to read what? Anybody know? The comics. And there's so much good theology in comics, right? Like so much. I, I had to share one. I read this actually in, inside a commentary, so it's got to be theological. But here's this comic. I, I memorized the Bible verse that we were supposed to memorize for Sunday. Oh, yeah? What verse? I don't know. You made me forget. Well, maybe it was something Moses said, something from the book of reevaluation. <laughs> now, you laugh because you don't know. It's the book of Revelation, not Revelations, right? Like, we don't know. Revelation. Forgetting isn't always a bad thing, Right? Now, how many of you guys honestly, no lying at church, how many of you guys honestly, you were almost like scared of this series in Revelation? Anybody? Like, some of you are like, oh man, I'm so glad we only have a month left. I want to forget it all. Please hear me. Don't forget the book. I mean, what's the big idea? God wins. He's already won. He's winning now. God wins. Do not forget the book. That this book changes everything. God, in his grace and in his mercy, he tells us the final score. Why? So we stop being Christians that are yelling at the TV at halftime. That's why. Because we don't have to freak out. Like, I love that song we just sang, but it's a song of repentance for me. Why do I worry? I don't know about you, but why do I worry? I worry because I don't trust that God wins. That's why I worry. I worry because life is hard. Is life hard for anybody else? Someone told me, man, Drew, you've been crying a lot in this Revelation series. I'm like, that's because I, I see humanity for what it is. And humanity is ugly. But God, he's not done with the world. He loves the world. That's why he gave his son. Like, God is not done with the world, but the world is ugly. And there are moments in our life, everyone in this room, you came in this morning and you're like, yeah, but the cancer's back. Yeah, but, but my husband left. Yeah, but you don't know about my daughter. God does. And you're sitting in the middle of halftime or the second quarter, and so God, in his grace, he tells us the final score. Why? Because we don't have to worry. Somebody say amen. amen. He's already won. So please, church, hear me. Like, I know this book's been scary, kind of, but it has been such a source of hope and encouragement for me, and I'm so thankful that we've dove in. I'm so thankful that we've taken the time to say, God, who are you and what are you doing? Because today we're going to come to kind of a fork in the road. And again, we are accelerating these last couple of weeks as we come to the end of the book, as we get to see the future. God, in his grace and in his mercy, he shows us the final score. He shows us the end of the world. Why? Because there's points in our life where kingdom and empire converge. And the book in Revelation says that word is thelipsis. Now remember, most of these saints, if they're putting on the jersey of Jesus, that morning is going to cost them their life. Now, that's not true for us, but there are points in our life when there's a conversion of living as residents of the kingdom of God and living as residents of this empire that we call America or earth or the globe or the world, that those converge. And church, please hear me. There has to be a dissonance in your heart. If you're a member of the kingdom, this place will not feel like your home. Amen? If it feels like your home, that means you're probably getting too comfortable and you're probably not living in the kingdom. And so that's this conversion here. We call it the lipsis, when heaven meets earth, when empire leaves and joins the kingdom, and it's painful and it hurts. And so John writes this to the early church. Why? Remember, this book was not written to you. It's written for you, but it's written to the early church. Jesus gives John this message, and the message is God wins, endure. Why does he say endure? Because who here likes pain, honestly? Like most Giants fans right now. Right, there's this convergence of it's not going the way we want, and when it's painful, we, all of us, are tempted to take the Giants jersey off and go back to being Angel fans. Right, like, like that's the truth of the reality, and we read last week the truth of the early church, and we read some of those excerpts from, from historians that said, yeah, we're persecuting the early church so much so that some of them now are denying their faith. That's the fear that Jesus has, that John has for the early church. As they experience this thelipsis, they're going to give up on their faith. Church, endure. Endure. I know life is hard. Jesus never told you life would be easy. He just said, follow me and you'll get the good life. Oh, by the way, on the way to the good life, we're going to go to the cross. Follow me. Trust that my better is better. And if you're like me, how good is your trust? Not enough. So who here struggles with trusting Jesus today? Just raise your hand. This is like the two-hand point of the sermon, right? Like, if you don't struggle with trusting Jesus, then you probably don't care about trusting Jesus. 
Every one of us is here, and John has a message for the early church. Trust God. His better is better. God is good all the time, and what? It's easy to say when you're at church and the pastor prompts you. What about at diagnosis? What about when the gap is big? What about when suffering comes? Because for these early saints, they're literally suffering because they're putting on the jersey of Jesus. And there's a message for us. Now, again, this is where we've been. We've been looking at the judgments of God, the vision of God from chapter 4 through 16. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bold judgments. And we've been zooming in on this, they call it the great interlude, these three chapters. And that's where we've been. That's where we've been the last couple weeks. And it's framed. If you've been following along on our outline, I'd encourage you, we're in the sign section right now. We're in the section of signs where Jesus is giving us signs so that we can know the final score, so we can see the future, so we're not caught off guard. Like literally Satan tips his signs. He says, I'm throwing you a curveball. Church, pay attention. Pay attention to what's coming. Now, how many of you is like the good news first or the bad news first? What do you want? Bad news. Bad news. That was first service too. Everybody wants the bad news first. Here's the grace of God. He frames the bad news with good news on both sides. He gives the good news first, and he gives the good news last. But can I just tell you, this week's going to be ugly. We're going to talk a lot about judgment and repentance and sin. Are you ready? I mean, you're welcome to leave. I'm just saying that's where we're going. That's what the text is going to tell us. Next week will be similar, but I love how patient and gracious God is. On both sides, I think the meat of the message is verses 6 through 20. On both sides, we're going to see this good news. That in spite of the brokenness of the world, in spite of, we, we saw this last week where they're worshiping the beast. Why? Because they're like, we can't get rid of this thing. How is evil still existing? How is the beast still around? And some people are worshiping him. And yet, it feels like we're not making progress. But on both ends of the text today, we're going to see the lamb has followers. Has the lamb ever been abandoned before? Think about this. The lamb of God, has he ever been abandoned before? Yeah. Remember the good supper <laughs> when Judas betrays him? Or the cross? Or Peter, I'll never deny you. Has the lamb been abandoned? Yes. Here's the good news. In, as, in spite of how bad the world looks, there's coming a day when more and more people will repent and get off the throne of their heart. Amen. And not only does God win, but he invites people. In fact, his judgment is his patience and his love to invite us to trust him. And so again, we're going to see this beautiful picture. We saw the beast and his army last week. We're going to see the lamb and his army this week. Then we're going to see these two harvests, and then we'll close with a song of the lamb's army. This vision of the redeemed. So that's where we're going today. Here's my summary statement. We all are disciples and followers of whomever sits on the throne of our hearts. Remember, the beast doesn't care if Jesus sits on your throat. He just doesn't want anyone other than Jesus there. That's all he cares about. It could be you. It could be your family. It could be an evil thing. It could be a good thing. Just not Jesus. We're all following someone and something who sits on the throne of our heart. The question isn't, are we disciples? It's who are we following, the dragon or the lamb? Here's the fork in the road. Who is our source of allegiance? We've seen the way of the lamb. Now John says there's also people of the lamb. His angels are going to proclaim that through their, their faithfulness, even at their bloodshed, Jesus will reap a harvest of believers. So church, I get so excited at church. Why? Because we sing songs, we tell stories, we have a sermon, and then we send you to go. Because the harvest is what? Plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. The opportunities are abundant. And yet, honestly, pay attention. How does the harvest get, best get planted by Jesus? And how does it get harvested by Jesus? Through the blood of the saints. So there's going to be moments in our life when it feels like we're suffering, when it feels like the gap is big, and we are suffering, and it does hurt, and it's really painful, but God... He's redeeming a harvest through that. He will reap a harvest of believers because death for the believer is no longer an enemy, but it's a gateway to glory. Somebody say amen. Now, I don't want to be a depressing pastor. I just read the book, but you all are dying. We're on the same page there, right? Every one of us is dying, which means we don't have to be afraid of dying because it's already happening. We tend to fear the things that we don't know. So I've already told you, you're dying. You don't have to fear death. The question is, are you ready to die? That's the question. And so part of John's heart to give us the final score is to make sure that we're ready to die. The early church doesn't be afraid of dying. If they put on their Jesus jersey, it's almost guaranteed. Now the question is, can they live well? Can they fight for their joy together in the context of community? I think the text today will encourage us to live in the gap. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 1. Here we go. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. 
And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of the harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn that song except for the 144K who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These who have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth there is no lie was found for they are blameless. Then I, John, saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with this loud voice, fear God. Give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And then a second, another angel followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And then another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured from full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is the call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I, John, heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Spirit of God, I pray that you would help us see how we can be blessed. That you would allow us to rest in who you are and what you've done in the midst of the thalipsis that we experience and the thalipsis that this early church experienced. Would we be faithful? Would we endure? Would we see the signs that you've given us? Would we be able to see the present reality and the future reality? And would we recognize that you alone are good and worthy of our praise and our worship? And so, Spirit of God, I pray that you would speak for your glory and for the good of your people. May we repent and respond, and may you be glorified, we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Now, I told you this was going to be a tough series, be a long series. I, I went back and reread my sermon from week one about I'm going to avoid this book. I've avoided this book, but I feel like God's saying do it, so we're going to do it. But I also told you if we do it, we got a lot of homework. And you all said, yeah, I'm in, coach. Put me in. I'm going to do homework. Keep doing your homework. Before next week, I want to invite you to read Ezekiel 38 and 39. Go read Judges 5, verse 19, 2 Kings 23, 29. Like as bad as it is now in the text or now in the world, it's going to get worse. So let's be ready for it so that we're not caught off guard when we get there. Let's be prepared. Let's know the final score. But what I love is that today we're going to talk about some good news. So we're going to start with the good news. The good news is this, that in spite of how bad the world is, there's a remnant of people that trust and treasure Jesus. Now, I pray on some level I'm talking to some people like that today. If Jesus doesn't sit on the throne of your heart yet, I'm just thrilled you're here and hanging out with us. Welcome to Vintage Grace. You're going to not understand a ton of what we say. Talk to the person that invited you. I'm just pumped you're here. But church, if you trust and treasure Jesus, if he is the king and sits on the throne of your heart, he's giving us a heads up right now so that we're prepared for the future. And in the future, there's going to be 144,000 people that have said, I'm all in. I trust and I treasure Jesus. And he has saved them and they are a remnant and he has redeemed them. And so John gets this vision of the future. Here's what he sees. He sees a choir. Now I say this at Vintage Grace. Who's a part of the choir here? We are. Just by showing up, you sang, you got put in to the choir. Then I looked and behold on the Mount of Zion. Now again, you wonder why all the fighting in the Middle East, it's about the Temple Mount. That's what they're fighting about. At that Temple Mount, here's what he sees. He sees a choir that is formed. This is the place where old Israel Temple would have stood with 144,000 people that are singing a song. They're people that are marked by the name of the Father. It's written on their foreheads. Remember, there's an allegiance question right now. Are you going to follow the dragon or are you going to follow the lamb? And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and the sound of a loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And then they start to sing. Now they sing a new song. Now that, that word is important for us. Every time we see the phrase new song, it primarily is in the Psalms. It's not necessarily a new song to them, but it's a song they're re-singing. It's a song of thanksgiving. It's a song of victory. Why is it important that every morning we wake up and we sing a new song, even if we know the song? I preach the gospel myself every Sunday. Why? Because I forget. Every day I wake up because I get distracted. 
because I forget. And so they sing a new song. They sing a song of victory. They sing a song of the final score. They sing a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and before the elders. Remember I told you guys, Sunday mornings for me are like a foretaste of heaven. We're going to sing a lot of Jesus songs. It's also important that we practice our cardio, right? Because you remember Revelation 4, you've got the elders, right? And they're sitting on their thrones. And then every time people praise God, they get off their throne and they cast their thrones. And, and how often are they throwing their, their, their crowns down at the feet of Jesus? How often? Every second. So there's this cardio in heaven. Like, we better start be training for this. He alone is worthy of praise. That's what we see in the text. And so the living creatures, the elders, they're singing this new song before the throne. But no one could learn the song except for the actual 144K who had been redeemed. Have you ever listened to a cover band before that just isn't quite good enough? Isn't that the definition of a cover band? <laughs> right? They get to those certain notes and they just can't hit it, and you're like, yeah, you should leave that for Van Halen. Like, the, the big mean joke in our home, of course, is who sings that song? And everyone's like, oh, that's Taylor Swift. And, and then we're like, let's keep it that way. <laughs> like, if you know, you know. If you can sing the song, you can sing the song. If you can't sing the song, it's not going to work. Amen? And that's why you're like, well, then don't put me on the choir. It's a different song. Pay attention to what the, the song that they're singing. This new song is a song of victory. It's a song of redemption. It's a song of hope. It's a song of glory. No one could learn the song except for the 144K who what? Had been redeemed. Those people had a song. Why? Because they had a common experience. We say community is a common unity, but a communitas, a vintage grace, communitas has two key elements. Not a common unity, a common what? Master and mission. I think I'm going to add a third thing. It's a common song. That's what it is. It's a common song. Why? Because here's essentially what the gospel is. I want you to remind you what the gospel is. We were born to be in a relationship with God. He, he came to earth. He created the garden. He designed us with a throne on our heart. He sat there and he said, I love you, Drew. Trust me. Treasure me. I sinned. That's what the X represents. And in my sin, I was now dead in my sin, far from God, cast out of the garden, but God being rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love, he gave his son for me. He took me who was dead and he made me alive again. And that makes me what, church? Happy. I was dead, but God makes me alive and I'm thrilled with this exchange. His life for my life, his death for my death. And so church, when we gather on a Sunday morning, please hear me. I've heard people say, well, church is like a family reunion. No, it's not. No one wants to go to a family reunion. Church is so much deeper it's not about our name, it's about his name. It's not about our blood, it's about his blood. Common master, common mission, common experience. Church, we have gone through something tragic and we call it what? Sin. Everyone in this world has gone through something tragic by knocking God off the throne of their heart. It's called sin. And so for these 144K, please hear me, when they're singing a song, it's one of those things where it's like, man, if you know, you know. I was dead, but God made me alive, and that makes me happy. Church, we sing a song that the outside world doesn't understand. They don't get it. I'll never forget living in the hospital and, and the doctor came and, and she said, okay, pastor, all your parishioners are gone. My oldest son was diagnosed with cancer at the age of two. And she said, Muslim doctor, she says, all your parishioners are gone. You don't have to pretend to be happy anymore. I was like, please hear me. Cancer sucks. Somebody say amen. Yes. But my joy is not rooted in life. My joy is rooted in his death and our future life. Amen. Yes. A month later, she came back and apologized to us as mom and dad. She said, wow, you still believe what you believed before. And it wasn't we were getting good news from the doctors. Please hear me, church. There is no bad news in the kingdom of God, only news that he's using for his glory and your good. Amen? Amen. Yeah, but what does that mean when your son has cancer? We went into the hospital with five other pastoral families. Four didn't make it out. Braden was the only one that survived. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. It's so easy to say it, church. It's so different to say when you don't get what you want, but do you trust that God's better is better? And if you're like me, that answer is not enough. So be patient with yourself. Take a deep breath. You're never saved by what you've done, but by what he's done. That's good news, because if you're like me, you don't have enough faith to be saved, amen? amen. But what I do have, though, is a joy in Jesus that says when I am broken, when I don't trust, when I don't believe his better is better, he still pursues me. He still loves me. He's still patient with me. And so there's this joy in Jesus. That's the song that they're singing. 
These four living creatures and elders in the 144K, they're singing a song of redemption. I was dead, but God made me alive, and that makes me happy, and I want to give him all the glory. Amen? That's the song. And so church, please hear me. Be patient with the yet to believe, because they don't get it, because they don't know the song yet. Let's be praying that they do. Let's be praying that they see it in you, that they see this new song, that they get to proclaim the story of God, the glory of salvation, the song of Exodus chapter 15, and moving forward. He describes the choir. He describes those who trust and treasure Jesus. It's those who have not defiled themselves. There are seven things here. For they are worth virgins, and in those things that follow the lamb, wherever he goes, where does the lamb go? To the cross, to be sacrificed. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits of God of the Lamb. In the mouth there is no lie to be found, for they are what? Blameless. Now again, please hear me. Do these seven things describe you to a T? Nope. Nor do I even think they describe the 144K in their humanity. They describe what God has done for them. That's how they're saved by what he's done. And because of the work of God, they are blameless. There is no lie coming out of their mouth. That's in direct contrast to the allegiance of the beast and the dragon who is called the father of lies. That these believers, that these 144K, that this remnant that says, I trust and trust Jesus, that they have been redeemed from mankind. Why? Because mankind is broken and needs redemption. They've been saved. They were purchased with a price. He talks at the beginning about sexual immorality, not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins. He's simply saying sexuality is a sign of allegiance. That's what it is. Sexuality is a sign of covenant. Sex is a good thing. I grew up in the church and some people say sex is bad. That's not true. I'd ask my friends. Everyone in the church says sex is bad. They're like, no, sex is good. Okay, it's good in the way that God designed it. But outside of the way God designed it, it is bad. Why? Because it's not used for his glory and for the good of humanity. But here's the point. Sexuality is about covenant. That's what it's about. It's about relationship with God. It's about believing that he is in control. And so that's what these seven descriptions, are we for the lamb or are we for the beast and for ourselves? Do we trust that the kingdom eats empire for breakfast? Or are we kind of straddling the line because there is a line today and you can't be in both. You're a part of the kingdom stuck in the empire or you're a part of the empire resisting the kingdom. That's the line today that we see in Revelation. The temperature is getting tuned, turned up. There's one answer of allegiance. And now we get to what I would argue is the, the, the bad news. But again, church, no bad news. No bad news in the kingdom. Here's what we see starting in verse 6. The angels arrived, three of them. And I saw another angel flying directly overhead with this eternal gospel to proclaim. That those who dwell on earth to every nation, tribe, language, and people, that God is constantly calling and wooing people to trust him. He's constantly calling them to go back to the eternal gospel. Eternal life is said 18 times in the gospel. Why? Because it's not just good news for today, but good news for an eternity of tomorrow. And so what is the gospel? The gospel is more joy in Jesus. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is this arrow over here is significant to us as a church. Everyone's pursuing their joy. The gospel is that Jesus is the source of joy. He's the author of joy. He's the inviter of joy. And so the text says, I saw another angel proclaiming the gospel, trust Jesus, treasure Jesus. He redeems us. He rescues us. He alone is worthy of praise. And he said with this loud voice, fear God and give him glory. Church, I'm, I'm a little afraid that we don't fear God enough. If we know who we are and who he is, go read the Old Testament. They feared God. They, they tied ropes around their priest's ankles. Why? Because they were afraid of the holiness of God. Part of the miracle of the gospel is that God is worthy of praise and he's holy and he's righteous and he's worthy of fear because of our sin and yet he's approachable. Amen? Emmanuel, God with us, he came towards us. The prodigal son gets run to by the father. The father's not sitting back saying, would you just get your crud together? He runs to you. He's a God worthy of holy, righteous fear, and yet he's approachable. Why are we afraid of God? Because the hour is near. Now, for those of us who trust and treasure Jesus, the wrath of God has been poured out on Jesus for you. So we're not afraid of the end times. We're not afraid of the hour of judgment. In fact, that's what we see in John chapter 12, verses 23, 24, 27, and verse 31. The hour of judgment has come. If your judgment that you deserve is poured out on Jesus, are you afraid of the hour of judgment? No. Church, I pray you don't have any fear of the hour of judgment because Jesus paid the price that you couldn't. He deserved none of the wrath. You deserved all of it, and he traded you his life for yours. And so the hour of judgment is near. If you don't trust and treasure Jesus, are you afraid of the hour of judgment? I am. I'm terrified because I know who I am, and I know what I deserve, and so far Jesus has not given me what I deserve. But when that time comes, when the hour comes, I'm terrified 
And he says this, and now they worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The first angel simply proclaims, the time has come, the time is now. And so we have to fear God. We have to be ready to repent. And so for those of us who trust and treasure Jesus, it's a good day. For our friends that don't trust and treasure Jesus, is the return of Jesus a good day? No. No, it's a terrible day. It's a day to fear. It's a day of judgment. It's a day of wrath. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. He will not forbear his wrath for much longer. And that's what Jesus tells John to tell the early church. And then another angel comes, a second angel followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Babylon thinks that they're still kicking butt and taking names, but they're not going to. She who made all nations drink the wine and the passion of her sexual morality. Remember, sex is a sign of covenant. It's a sign of allegiance. It's a sign of adultery. Regularly you'll see sex talked about all throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, as a sign of do you have a covenant with Jesus or do you have a covenant with Babylon? Now again, what I love about this is Babylon we're going to see later as a prostitute. She's wooing us with sex. She's wooing us with power. She's wooing us with deeds. She's offering us a cup of wine of her seduction. Now again, in their cultural context, would you had meals with people? When you broke bread, when you drank a beverage with them, it was a sign of covenant, just like sex was. It was a sign of covenant. Now, again, did Jesus ever have food or beverage with people that didn't love the Father or love the Son? Yeah. Remember the woman at the well? He goes and he says to her, hey, can I get a glass of water? And what does she say to him? No, no, no. You can't have water with me because you and I aren't alike. And Jesus says, you know what? You don't need water. You need living water so that you will never what? Thirst again. So you will finally be satisfied. Beverage will not satisfy you. Sex will not satisfy you. Power will not satisfy you. The only thing that will satisfy you is him sitting on the throne of your heart. That's it. That's what we see in Revelation. And yet Babylon is going to show up, and Babylon then in the past, in the present Rome for them, and in our present, every other empire after them. They're going to promise things like sex and food and beverage and power, and they're going to say, man, if you would just drink of this cup, you'll be happy. Have you noticed sin always overpromises and underdelivers? Every time. Every time. And here's what Jesus says. Babylon is promising, but at the end of life, Babylon is going to fall. The prostitute will not be able to deliver. Judgment is coming. Church, go read Isaiah 21, Jeremiah 51, and Revelation 20. In all of these texts, what we see is that fear and judgment is coming, and yet all of judgment prior to the great judgment is a grace of God. The great judgment's coming. That's the important part. You know when I say things like life's short, hell's hot, right? It's these kind of texts that I'm getting this from. Judgment is coming, and God in his grace taps us on the shoulder and says, dude, you're in my seat. And if you're in my seat, you're gonna get the judgment that you deserve. If you're in my seat, you're gonna get the wrath that you deserve, because here's the truth of the matter. God is giving Babylon a chance to repent through these judgments. Church, do we like that God gives us chances to repent? Yes, because we needed to repent. Because we, like everybody else in the world, sat on the throne of our heart and God tapped us on the shoulder and by his grace and his mercy, we did repent. But here's the deal. If we're going to drink with Babylon, if we're going to be in relationship with her, then we're also going to get what she deserves and what she earns. Here's what the text says. And another angel, a third one, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, if they're in covenant relationship with the beast, if they put the mark of the beast, the image received on his forehead and on his hand. Now remember last week we said you're never going to get the mark of the beast on accident. You're going to choose. It's a mark of allegiance that I've chosen to follow the beast and not the lamb. But if you're going to put that mark on you, then you will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured how much? Now, again, I don't even want to read the words. I'll let you read them. Again, wine for them was one-third wine, two-thirds part water. This is a full strength of wine. And again, I grew up in a church context that would say things like, well, love the sinner and hate the sin. The more I've grown in my faith, I really believe the text really teaches, love the sinner, hate my sin. Who deserves the wrath of God? We'll be in Romans next fall. Who deserves the wrath of God? Another two-hand point of the sermon, guys. I do. You do. We do. And the angel comes to Babylon and says, Babylon's going to fall. Get off the throne of your heart. The wrath of God is deserved. It's earned by me. And so it's coming now to say, guys, pay attention to what's coming in the future. If you drink of the seduction, you'll drink of the wrath that the seduction deserves. And that's a verse that scares me because I know what I deserve. It's not about loving the sinner and hating their sin. I got too much of my own sin to deal with to worry about their sin. Amen? 
Love the sinner and hate the sin. And if we love the sinner, we're going to repent of our sins and say, there's a God that can save you of yours too. Amen? That's why he taps Babylon on the shoulder, the full strength of God's wrath, the cup of his anger. He's going to be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the lamb. The severity of sin is infinite, church. Don't miss this. We don't talk about sin enough. It separates us from God, and it doesn't just hurt us today, but it hurts us for an eternity of tomorrows. And the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, no day, nor night. These worshipers of the mark of the beast on its image, whoever receives the mark in its name, there's this crisis of choice. So no wonder why we as Christians love John 3.16. Who loves John 3.16? For God so loves the world, the sinner, me, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would, what? Would believe, would repent, would go through their heart, believe in the gospel, that they would not, what? Perish, but have? Church, somebody say amen. amen. We were dead in our sin, but God makes us alive. That makes us happy. And now we get to party in heaven forever with Jesus. Like that's the future. Know the final score so you don't freak out at halftime. Now, one of the things I get concerned about in the Church of America, we memorize verses, we put them on bumper stickers, we put them on like mugs and those kind of things, and we forget what the rest of it says. You got to read the verse in context. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Guess what? At the end of the world, he will condemn the world. That's what we're going to see in a moment. Jesus shows up not to condemn, but what? To save the world. He comes to save the world that it might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him and is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he didn't believe in the name of the only son of God. He knocked him off the throne of our heart. Verse 19 is painful. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were what? Church, that's you and me and everyone after Adam and Eve. We chose the darkness over the light, but God, being rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love, he gave his son for you. Repent. And there's this crisis of choice for Babylon and for anyone in this room that has not gone through on your heart. There's a crisis of choice today because you are dying, because you will meet the Father, you will meet the Son, you will speak to the Spirit three in one, and he will say, why shall you into my heaven? Because every one of us, Romans says this without an excuse, every one of us has rejected the love of the Father. Everyone. And that deserves wrath and judgment, and that judgment is coming, and we're afraid of it unless we know that the judgment has already been placed on Christ. Then we have nothing to fear. Amen? Amen. Now we're freed to worship. We don't have to fear judgment and wrath. We're freed to worship. And here is the call, and I love it when John does this. I love when John's like, hey, Drew, here's the big idea. You can't screw it up. Here it is. Are you paying attention? Here is the call. Endurance of the saints. Church, endure. There's going to be gaps in your life. There's going to be thalipsis in your life. Endure, endure, endure. I don't know about you, but again, some of you are going to go on summer vacations, right? And in your car, what's going to happen? Inevitably, especially if you have little kids. Inevitably, during that trip, a kid's going to say what? Are we? It's such an annoying question. No. If we were there, you wouldn't be here. We'd be out of the car, and we would be there. I don't know about you guys. I sin with my kids, and I repent regularly, and that's part of my fathering, right? Like... Guys, the saints have been crying out to Jesus. Are we there yet? Are we done dealing with the crap of this world? Does anyone else notice it's getting worse? Like we talked about Buffalo two weeks ago and now we're already talking about Texas. Here's the problem. We will not solve spiritual problem with empire solutions, ever. Now, God is sovereign, we are responsible. Don't diminish our responsibility either. We better be doing everything we can to attack the issue, but the issue is a heart one, amen? There's no way we're gonna solve the brokenness of this world, which means we cry out to the only one that can, Maranatha, Jesus, come. And on one level with that prayer, we're celebrating, we're anticipating a second coming, but then we're also recognizing that life is short and hell is hot, and there's a ton of my family and a ton of my friends that aren't ready for him to come which means church, we got work to do, amen? We've got people to love. We've got people to engage with. Instead of writing on Facebook, we need to be inviting people over for beverages so we can invite them to a covenant relationship, not with the prostitute, but with the savior. That's the text in Revelation today. That's the good news of the gospel. Here's the call, endure saints, endure. Are we there yet? You'll know when you get there. Don't fight over are we there yet, you'll know. And I'll usher you in to my kingdom not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done for you.
and it will be a beautiful day and you will sing a song like no one has ever understood. He said, for those who keep the commandments of God when their faith endures in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Now, no wonder why I as a preacher love it when John says, here's the big idea. I think John loved it when the angels were like, hey, John, write this. I love that he's patient with us. Write this. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed. Now, how many of you guys love to be blessed, right? We're, in, we're Americans, man. I just, I want to live a hashtag blessed life. And blessed means what, guys? It means, it means a six-figure income, although with the way that inflation's going, it might be like 200K, not 100K, right? Blessed means $200,000. Blessed means a white picket fence. We own a home, ideally with a lake view. We have two and a half kids, because America can't decide. Is it three or is it two? Let's just have five, right? Like, that's the blessed life. Here's the problem. That is not in the Bible anywhere. Jesus says, follow me, pick up your cross, deny yourself. What's a cross for? To die. The way of the lamb is a way of death. Why? Because if we die for him, we'll also live with him. Amen? Amen. Pay attention. How does the church grow so fast? Through the witnesses laying down their lives, trusting God enough not just to live for him, but also die for him. And so today you're like, man, I'm ready to die for Jesus. Church, that day may come. Can we start living for him today? Be ready to die for him, but live for him today and recognize the upside down kingdom of God. I heard a voice that said, blessed. Here's the problem. The word blessed in the New Testament, go read James, go read 1 Peter. The word blessed means spiritually complete. The word blessed does not mean healthy. That's not what the word blessed means. The word blessed actually means happy. It means spiritually complete. It means that when we get cancer, which again, the stats I'm reading says almost all of us will at some point. It means that when I get cancer and the doctor says you're going to die from it, you say, I already knew I was dying. Thanks for letting me know. Now, I'm not saying cancer doesn't suck. I'm not saying life's not hard. But what I am saying is when we sing songs like you are my cornerstone, you are my rock and my firm foundation, and with you I'm going to make it through, make it through might not actually mean healing. It might mean being set free from the bondage of sin in this world and actually rejoicing with Jesus and singing a new song. Amen? Amen. That's the gospel. Blessed are those who are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And so the question isn't, am I dying? The question is, am I dying in the Lord or not? That's the question. Blessed indeed. I love that Jesus is preaching the sermon to John and the Holy Spirit's like, preach. You see it? Like the Holy Spirit's like, amen. Blessed indeed. That's the amen. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and for their deeds follow them. And we will not be judged by what we've done, but by what he's done for us. Is anyone else ready for heaven? Maranatha, the Lord Jesus, come. And yet I live in this tension of the kingdom and the empire. And as much as I pray that he would come back and redeem us from the crap of this world, I also recognize that until he does, these are opportunities for kingdom movement. Because the harvest is coming. He gives us these seven benedictions in chapter one, verse three. I told you, I'm going to preach this book. I'm going to preach this book partly because as your pastor and as one of the preachers, I'm just going to promise you'll be blessed. Chapter one, verse three, he who reads it, hears it and keeps it will be blessed. Church, let's live our faith. Let's die for our faith. Today was benediction number two, dead who die in the Lord. He goes on in the next few weeks, we're going to have a lot of benedictions as he's wrapping up this book. Church, I love this letter. It's changing my life. It's giving me a hope in the midst of the gaps, the gaps today and the gaps for tomorrow, because the gaps aren't going away, but he's going to redeem every moment. And the harvest is here. The harvest is plentiful. And so here's the shoulder tap from the father. It's the father loving you so much. He's tapping on the shoulder saying, are you sitting in my son's seat? Give the seat to my son. Repent, get off the throne of your heart. And so there's two harvests that are going to come. I think they're two sides of the same coin. The question is, which harvest describes you and which harvest doesn't? Here's the first harvest. It's a good one. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud seen on the cloud was one like the son of man. I think this is Jesus, golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And he goes on. Another angel comes from the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Jesus, put your sickle out and reap for the hour has come. Reap for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. And so Jesus, remember, he came to die for our fit, but he also came to show us how to live. He listens to the Father through the angel. And so he sat on the cloud and he swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. Matthew chapter nine. We pray this prayer every day, right? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest. Why? Because the harvest is white. It is ripe for harvest. Here's what I think he says. Part of me was repenting. I'm like, man, I I wish that we would have preached this before COVID because then we would have been ready. I think COVID was a moment for the church. I think vintage, you did well. The church of America, not so well. 
But COVID was a moment for us to step in. Why? Because when there's gaps in our life, people are asking what's going to make them happy. They're not settling. They're actually asking questions. Now, here's the good news. Church of America, if you're listening, which you're not, that's okay. But if you're listening, there will be future COVIDs. (laughs) There will be more gaps. There will be more opportunities. There will be more cancer. There will be more divorce. There will be more settling for less. Church, we must be ready to step into those gaps. My heart is simply this. Church, we must not answer a question that people are not asking, but we must live in a way that they ask you the question. Don't answer a question they're asking. They're not ready. But here's the deal. They're going to be asking questions when things like COVID happens because they recognize they're afraid. They're afraid of death. And they look at you and they're like, you're not afraid of death. They look at you and they say, man, your marriage has issues just like my marriage. And I go, yeah, absolutely. The difference between me and you is I'm not done because Jesus is one. He's redeeming. He's reclaiming. And so Jesus goes to Matthew 9 and he says, man, the harvest is plentiful, labors are few. Make that not true of you. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, he says his barns for the harvest are what? They're big barns. Church, you have neighbors that need Jesus. Does that get anyone else excited? When we pray Maranatha and my neighbors aren't ready for that, I want to go invite them over for a beverage. I want to invite them over for a meal. I want to invite them over to have covenant with them so that they can see there is someone and something worth worshiping. And it's not Lake Folsom, and it's not their money, and it's not their health or their wealth. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Where's your allegiance? That's the first harvest. I pray that describes us, church. I pray that describes us. Here's the second harvest. Then another angel came out from the temple in heaven. He too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who had this authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice, the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle, gather the clusters from the vine of the earth for its grapes are what? Right. If you've cried out to God and said, God, the pain of this earth, the evil of humanity feels like it's getting more full. I affirm that. And I think it's coming to a bursting point. That's the end times. That's the truth of what Revelation is saying. The evil of humanity continues to grow, and it's going to come to a point where Jesus says, enough is enough. And so church, that's good news for those of us who the wrath of God has already been placed on Jesus for us. But for those who haven't, he's going to come and consider a harvest. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth, and he gathered the great harvest of the earth, and he threw it into the great wine press. Now, the wine press is an actual tool, but when it's used metaphorically, please don't miss this, it's regularly used for judgment passages. Go read Isaiah 62, or Lamentations 1, or Joel 3. The pain of humanity, the sin of humanity, is at a full point at this point. And the harvest time is now. The wine press then is trodden outside of the city. Why? Because it doesn't belong in the city. Only holiness belongs in the city. And blood flowed, blow, blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's brittle, 1,600 stadia. Now, 1,600 stadia, it could be 4 by 4. It could be 10 by 10. I think it's a sign and a symbol of completeness that the day is coming when God will say, enough is enough. I'm tired of talking about Buffalo. Enough is enough. I'm tired of talking about sin and I'm tired of allowing things to go by. It's his grace and his mercy why he even allows these things to happen because he's giving us chances to repent. But at some point, God will say enough is enough and I will have complete justice and my wrath will be poured out. And for those of you who trust Jesus, it is a good day. But for those who do not, it will be a day of suffering this harvest. It'll be a day of suffering where all of sin will be dealt with, and it's only dealt with in this one way. See, the question is not how does a a loving God send people to hell. It's how does a righteous God let people into heaven? The reality is this. It's easy how does a loving God send people to hell because we chose it, because the darkness hated the light. It rejected the light, and because God is holy, and because God is good, and because God is loving, the day is coming when he will say enough is enough. 1600 stadia is the same period of land between northern Israel and southern Israel. I think he's just simply saying it's going to be all of the world, all of the sin, all of earth is going to be dealt with. And instead of ending there, I love we get to end in chapter 15. We get to close with, but guys, some are going to respond. Some are going to front of your heart. So don't stop being ready to give an account for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. Don't stop praying and watching and stepping. Not until he comes back. When he comes back, you don't have to pray and watch anymore. Now you just get to enjoy But for now, the harvest is plentiful. The labors are few and there's people out there to be redeemed. Then I saw another sign. This is the bookend of the interlude. Great and amazing. Seven angels, seven plagues. That's next week's text. It's going to be ugly. Come back still, please. (laughs) But it's going to be ugly. The wrath of God is ugly and worthy of fear. But it's also worthy of worship because he will not stand it any longer, which are the last for them. And the wrath of God will be finished. It's coming. 
And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number on its name standing behind the sea of glass with harps of God in their hand. And he, he makes a reference back to chapter two, the white stone. Someone in our church gave me this stone. They say, Pastor, thanks for preaching on the white stone. Remember the white stone represents, it represents a not guilty verdict. That, that's Jesus' seat. The white stone represents a new name a new allegiance, a new jersey that we've been given to wear. Not what we've done, but what he's done for us. And I can't help but think about this song as the the Israelites are running out of Egypt. It's a song from Moses. It's a song from Exodus chapter 15. And they're going to sing this song as they're journeying out of the captivity of sin. And here's their song. Great and amazing are your deeds, O God, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Church, we're called to sing this new song. It's it's not a new song. It's a song back from Egypt. It's a song back from Exodus. It's a song from Jesus' day and it's a song from our day. It's a song of value and worship and worth. And so what are the implications? The implications are simply this. We have an eternal gospel. The word gospel is good news, euangelion. We have an eternal gospel. We must have pictures of victory in our heads. We must have it in our hearts. Remember, nothing new theologically is being shared in Revelation. It's just being shared in such a way that we start to go, oh, that's the woman at the well. Oh, that's the picture from Exodus. Oh, now I see how the whole book fits together. It's these visions of victory and these visions of judgment. We must wake up in the morning and preach the gospel to ourselves. I, Drew, was dead in my sin, but God makes me alive, and that's what makes me happy. Yeah, but my son has cancer. I know, cancer sucks, but God wins. And my marriage is broken. That happened when you joined the team. And God's faithful and patient in the midst of your brokenness. He's with you. He's for you. Yeah, but the gap is big. And yet, the gospel says that we are more than conquerors. Now, even that word that we just read, those conquering, it doesn't translate super well in the English text like we just read. It's simply this. You are more than a conqueror today in the present tense. Why? Because in the future, you win because it's his life for your life. And in the past, you already won because it was his death for your death. And so church today, you are more than a conqueror. So endure, recognize this. Cancer may kill you, but it's just escorting you to glory. That's what it is. And you're like, Drew, that feels like religion is just a crutch. Guys, religion is not a crutch. It's like a gurney. It's like the whole thing. Crutch is not a strong enough term It's a heart transplant, that's what it is. It's a my life for his life. It's a my death for his death. Death is winning the battle with cancer and that doesn't necessarily mean that you leave the hospital. It means that you enter glory. And so they sing a new song. They sing a new song and the song is the gospel that he came, that we rejected, that he rescued, that he raised, that he created in us a communitas with a common master and a common mission and a common song to sing and he's coming back. He's not sitting around going, I'm just going to let this keep happening. No, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come. May we be ready. And so until that day, church, may we sing. May we become people that sing the song of God's grace. May we become the people that sing the songs of his goodness. We become the kind of people that as we step into the batter's box, our coach says, hey, Drew, they're going to throw you a curve, and it's going to be hanging. It's going to be right in the middle. And you know it's coming, so don't be caught off guard. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. The curve is coming, and one way to endure is to sing. There's a power of singing. I'm thrilled you're on our church choir. There's a power of singing. Like, what happens when Paul is thrown into the prison in Philippi? You remember what he does? He sings. He sings songs. He sings songs of the gospel. He sings songs of the glory. You know what happens when the Israelites are crossing the river? You know what some of them are doing? They're singing. You know what happens as they celebrate being healed physically from cancer? They sing. You know what happens when they get healed spiritually from cancer? They sing. You know what happens when they suffer? They sing. They sing the song of God's grace and of his glory. In fact, all of those verses that we just read, the song of Moses, they all come from other verses. Church, memorize scripture, sing scripture, put it in your head and in your heart, write it on your foreheads and on your wrists so that when you forget, you remember that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Don't forget, endurance is required, believers. And as we endure, we remember that there is a stone for each and every one of us. I want to invite you to to grab your communion elements. 
I want to invite you to open those now. If you don't trust and treasure Jesus, I just encourage you, don't take communion with us. It won't mean anything to you. It does make sense. But if you trust and treasure Jesus, would you open this and would you pull out the wafer? Because here's what the gospel says. The gospel simply says this, that Jesus Christ is a stone. In Isaiah chapter 8, he can be a stone of stumbling or he can be a cornerstone. In Isaiah chapter 28, it says the same thing. In Romans 9, 1 Peter 2, says the same thing. It says this, there's a stone in the middle of your path. Will he be the cornerstone that you build your life on or will he be a stone of stumbling? You have to choose to either accept or reject. And so communion is a reminder for those of us that have chosen to accept Jesus. That we've made a trade, we've made an exchange. His life for our life. His death for our death. Church, will you break this element? Would you let it be a reminder so we don't forget that his body was broken for you, so take this in remembrance of him. Would you open the cup? Which again is a symbol of not just his body broken, but now of his blood shed. That when we meet the Father face to face, he says, why shall you into my heaven? It's simply this, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so we receive his life for our life and his death for our death. Would you take this in remembrance of him? So Jesus, we say thank you. We say thank you for the cross. We say thank you for the gospel. We say thank you for your judgment and your wrath that was poured out on Jesus so that we might have life and have it to the full. We deserve the full wrath of you, Father. But in Christ, we've received full mercy and grace. So we receive you as our firm foundation. We've taken time this morning to reflect and to repent and to receive your work, your life, your death, your resurrection. And so we say thank you for the cross. We say thank you for your life. We say thank you for your endurance, that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You did not deny the request of the Father and you made a way for me and for us and for we to become a son when we were far from you. So church, right now we have repented, we have reflected, we have remembered, and now we sing a new song. It's not going to be a new song, it's a song that we know, but it proclaims this is what we believe. Church, let's sing this right now together.